Today, my partner here, we're going to talk to you about the use of computational thinking in DNA sequencing. So actually, we'd like to kick it off with a video to kind of give some context to the case study we looked at. That might is trying to save his son's life. When Bertrand was born, he really baffled doctors. He had very unusual symptoms and no diagnosis for four years. At the end of four years, we finally got an answer. And they said, we think your child is the first ever patient with Engli-1 deficiency. This disease had never been documented before, anywhere. There were no known patients and no treatments. Matt and Christina might were alone. We know essentially nothing about this. So if anyone's gonna do anything about this disorder, it just became us. So clearly the next step is uh, how this guy actually saved his son. So you can guess it obviously related to com size and stuff. So yeah. Matt didn't have much experience with biology, but he was a professor of computer science, and he wondered if genetic testing could help them finally get a diagnosis. So the human genome is like the manual of operations for the human body. It's how to build you and how to operate you. He got an idea. Could they compare his DNA with Christina and Bertrand's? I was thinking, gosh, couldn't we just take the three of our genomes, compare them like strings like we do in computer science, and find the mutations where we differ? Because uh, these are likely causing the disease. And it worked. He had inherited a mutation from me and a mutation from my wife, Christina, and a gene called NGLY1. And what this did is it wiped out the function of this gene and caused his condition. So this was exciting. After four years with no answers, they finally got a diagnosis. Okay, so um, we actually looked at the hunt for a diagnosis. So actually went to through four years with no diagnosis. So actually made this realization that uh, pretty much when you look at the coding of uh, the DNA, uh, these are the base pairs from uh, APGC, little uh, person next page. So technically they run the same as computer codes. There's only this possible four letters and uh, there's actually, when the DNA, you know, the, the, it's actually two, how's it? It's actually two chains of these base pairs, and these actually uh, give the instructions for the body to code for various proteins. So in this case, yeah, this is a better illustration. So there's adenine, thymine, uh, guanine, and cytosine. So all these possible combinations code for the full protein structure. So in the case of um, Matt Mike, he realized that these were essentially strings. So how mutations occur? So 40% um, of the human genome is uh, transposable, and whenever there's a replication, there's a chance of an error. And uh, this, yeah. So one particular case would be in strand slippage mispairing. So uh, in this case, there's either insertion or deletion of uh, any of the possible base pairs. So the next natural question is, if you want to find out what is causing the mutation, you need to search through the entire string to find out uh, where's the error. So sequencing the genome to detect for mutations uh, actually, actually clarifies some terminology. There's uh, some in um, computational medicine, there's this term called a read. So what is a read? So a read is an inferred sequence of, uh, of base pairs, and this is from a particular fragment of the DNA. So uh, typical sequencing, uh, experiment actually consists of fragments of millions of uh, DNA molecules. Uh, and then the issue here is uh, current sequencing technologies are actually quite limited. So the, you only can read 100 to 500 base pairs. The best technology is only 1,500. However, the human genome has far more base pairs than that. Uh, anyone has a guess? Okay, never mind, I'll just say. So the human genome has uh, actually 3 billion over base pairs. So to sequence for this entire uh, genome to look for mutations, we actually have to come up with an appropriate algorithm. And with the use of computational technology, you actually find out what is the problem. So this is actually the, called the realignment problem. So there are billions of base pair reads. So usually this is about uh, you know, a sample of what you get uh, when you run through experiment. But you actually have to compare against this entire reference sequence, but millions of these. So, yep. Uh, so, 
volume mall string search algorithm is the main algorithm used to actually conduct this string search. So uh, what is it? Some background. It's created in uh, 1977. And what it does is it passes an algorithm and for each, uh, for each of the, the characters, it tries a character comparison. And uh, however, it actually has a, the, the, the advantage of it is that unlike uh, naive character matching, it is able to skip alignments that it does not need to examine. And later, uh, Abhidhi will go into technical details how it does that. And it's actually commonly used in indexing and file search. So I mean, if you are familiar with this icon here, uh, this is the main algorithm used uh, with regards to that. So uh, now I'll pass on my time to Abhidhi, who will actually go on to explain uh, naive string matching and uh, how uh, Boyer Moore is used. Okay. Thank you. So. If you look at this, this is like a text, and this is the pattern you're trying to match with that text. So according to naive string algorithm, you first start from the leftmost side of the text. You see if that matches with the pattern. It doesn't, so you move on to the next character. It doesn't match, so you keep moving on, and you go through the entire sequence of the pattern till there is a match. So essentially, like this is like a 10 character string. So if it's larger, it'll go through each and every outcome and then it'll s find a match. So this will take a long amount of time. So that's where the Boyer-Moore algorithm actually comes in. So for this algorithm to work, you need to construct a bad match table, which I'll explain in the next slide. And you don't compare the elements anymore from the rightmost side. You compare it from the leftmost side. And like it said there, and uh, when there is a mismatch, you get the value from the bad match table, again, which I'll explain in the next slide. So here, this is the formula you use to get the value, is the length minus index minus one. So again, here's the text, this is the pattern. So from the pattern, you get the index from like left to right, it's, and you start from zero, because almost in all computational things, you start index from zero. So the length is equal to five, so here you get the value. So for z, it's five minus zero minus one, which is four. So consequently, you get the value of x and y. And for all the characters which aren't there in the pattern, the asterisk symbol represents that. And for that, the value is of the length, which you can see on the left-hand side. So there are certain rules which you need to apply for the bad match table. So there are no duplicates in the match table. So for like, there are two z's. So you don't have a duplicate, you just take one. And the two x's, again, you don't use a duplicate. And for the higher index, the latter one is noted. So you can see there are two x's. So, uh, uh, so the value changes to the right left, rightmost x. So that's a 5 minus 3 minus 1, which is a 1. And again, there's another rule for all the others uh, characters, you take the value as 5, and if your character, like, uh, there are two z's, right? So the last z, if there is a earlier representation of that character, you take the value of that. But if that z was a new character, like an A, you don't take the value from the formula, you take that value as 5, which is the length. So now that you have the bad match values for all the characters, uh, this is how the algorithm actually works. So here's the pattern, which is uh, shown below, and the text is shown above. So first you try to match it. So you try to match the Z with the V, since it does not exist, since like they're not equal. So you take the value from the bad match table, and you skip it by five steps, because the value of V is five. So after skipping, you, you essentially see you skip so many alterations of the uh, pattern because you got to skip five steps this side. And now again, you test uh, the Z with the Z. And since it does match, now you go to the left. And then you try to match the X with the V. Since it does not match, again, you move to the Z and get the bad match table value, which is four. So you skip four steps. So again, you do the same thing with the Z and the X, the answers you skip it by one, so you do the thing again, and you skip it by five, and then this is the final step, where you skip it by one more time, and you get a match. 
So essentially, you've skipped 16 uh, matchings. And uh, that total of the characters, 21 characters. So that you've skipped 16 steps. So this is, if you compare this to DNA sequencing, you'll see like uh, the text is very long. And this really helps in shortening down the, uh, the code length. So uh, for the code length, this is like a, a representation of what I just said in code form. So this would be like the bad match table function. That would be the boil function. And that would be uh, like how you implement it. And when you do call it, this would be the answer, which is a 9 and 21. And this represents the index of the first match. So there are two tooths in the target. So the first, the index of the t in the first tooth is 9, and the index of the t in the second tooth is 21. So now I hope that you got a better understanding of the Boyer-Mool algorithm, and I'll pass my time back to that. Yeah. Um, so actually, now on the bring it uh, back to our real life context. So I mean, uh, just want to clarify some stuff. So what you mean by nine twenty one is like, yeah, nine and then twenty one, and um, this is actually very relevant. Like if you actually use the Flux Explorer, you know, if you use computers, yeah. So <laughs> um. Yeah, so in advances uh, computational medicine, uh, in the past it used to cost a heck of a lot of money just to sequence a human genome. It used to be 100 mil, now it's just 50k. So, uh, you know, a lot of this uh, is due to help not just of uh, computational hardware, but also because of the algorithms that have been found. Uh, technically, there's more, but uh, to be honest, at our skill level, you know, we thought Boyle was uh, roughly our standard. So actually, now I'm going to continue on the story and tell you how uh, Matt might uh, so-called career went on. Since Bertrand's diagnosis, Matt has totally changed careers. He spent time at Harvard Medical School, the White House, and now he's running the Precision Medicine Institute at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He hopes to improve the application of precision medicine techniques for all diseases. All right, here we go. Matt and Christina have helped to identify 70 patients who have Engel I1 deficiency, none of whom would have been diagnosed without their work. And perhaps as important, they're part of a knowledgeable, supportive community. To go from a totally unknown disease to having multiple therapeutic treatments available in just six years, that's incredibly fast. But for Matt, it's just about doing whatever he could to help Bertrand. Science is the systematic transformation of the unknown to the known. It is therefore necessarily the transformation of the impossible to the possible. So science itself becomes the kind of medicine that you take when there's no medicine that you can. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so yeah, here's our work cited. Uh, yeah, quite a lot of stuff, la. quite some big ballers and stuff. Yeah, so any questions? Okay, th thanks, bro.